correct? So today we'll go over Mark chapter 6. So a little background on Mark first. Uh, the Apostle Mark, he was not one of the original 12. Apostle Mark, by some theologians, believe that he was actually a disciple of Peter, who was one of the first people that Jesus called to. A lot of theologians also believe that Mark was also a fisherman, and that's how they, they were able to make that connection. And the part, one of the biggest things I love about uh, Scripture is how the, the first four books really pair up with each other. So if you actually read, as you read through Mark, you start to see Mark never talks in the first person. Mark always says they, he uses the third person tense as he writes. And this was many, many years later. The early church, there was no Bible. You know, we're very blessed to be able to have the word where we can get in the word and read it in our own time. But in Mark's time and, and during the disciples period, it was all word of mouth. So to me, this is a great testament on the job that Peter did by going out there and sharing the word and sharing the love of Christ and sharing God's word with Mark were much years later, and they kind of estimate around 60 A.D. So that's quite a while later when this book was actually written, from what theologians believe. Um, so that's kind of a little brief background on Mark. So what I like to try to do is I, I believe in walking points, because it's one thing to read the Scripture, but how do we put it into our lives? How do we go out there into the community? How do we you know, make that part of our everyday life? is going out there. So the first walking point for Mark chapter 6 is we need to recognize changed lives and those that have turned their lives over to God. So if you have your Bibles, please go ahead and open them up to Mark chapter 6. When you're there, just go ahead and say word. All right, word of the Lord. I stole that from one of my pastors. All right, uh, I'm going to start off. I'll kind of set it all up. Um, like many, you know, we all grew up, we, everybody has a past. Everybody has a story and a background. If you knew me 10 years ago, you'd be like, there's no way this cat would ever be in front of a church, especially in Tennessee, okay? This was so far, not part of my plan, but it was part of God's plan. Amen to that. Um, so we all have a past. So when I go home back home to New England and my family kind of sees the new me, they have a hard time seeing the new me because they can still remember me back in the day as a child. And Mark chapter 6, this is where he's kind of setting that up. Jesus and the disciples are rolling back into his hometown, and he starts preaching. And people weren't receiving it too well. They're like, well, who is this kid? You know, wasn't he, like, making, like, furniture a couple months ago or a couple years ago? You know, who is he to be telling us about the Word of God? And they really questioned. They really pushed back, and they weren't buying what he was selling. Now, Obviously, he's the son of God. He understood that this, there was going to be some pushback. So go to Mark chapter 6, 5 through 6, where it says, He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So for me, I think of raising children. Like, daughter comes in, and she's got some high heels on. All of a sudden, I'm looking up at her. The Lord did not give me the gift of height. But when we raise our children, it's so hard for us to see their growth until somebody that hasn't seen them for a while is say, hey, look how tall Tommy's gotten. You've kind of had the blinders on. You don't realize, like, my stepson's six foot three. But in my eyes, he's always going to be four foot short from, you know, when we first came, uh, we first came to each other's lives. I've had blinders that to be able to see his growth as, as, him, as he's becoming a man now. And it's kind of difficult. And this was a problem right there. How often society today, when we have folks coming to the church in our community that we have not seen for a while, and we'll say, well, there's so-and-so. They had a drug problem back in the day. There's no way they could change. Or there's so-and-so. She got pregnant at the age of 16, and her life is no good. How often as a church body do we have a tendency of, I guess, I guess placing labels on folks for their past histories? As a church, we're supposed to be nothing more then opening and warming, and ex there's nothing more impressive than a changed life through Jesus Christ. That is, like I said, if you knew me 10 years ago, four, even four years ago, I was an alcoholic. I struggled with alcoholism and other, other struggles. You know, but through the grace of God, I've been able to change. And there are folks that have, see, have been able to alongside me and witness that change, 
and have loved on me and supported me and drove me through, my wife being one of them. Then there are others that knew the old me back in the day, and they struggle with, with seeing that new me. Rick Warren, Pastor Rick Warren at Saddleback Baptist Church uh, in California, said, transformation is a process, and as life happens, there are tons of ups and downs. It's a journey of discovery. There are moments on mountaintops and moments in deep valleys in despair. And to me, if I could add on to Rick's words, I'd like to say that when you go through your struggles, as long as you're keeping Jesus at your center, there's no way you're not going to come out stronger. Again, nobody can argue with a changed life. 2 Corinthians 5.17, you don't have to jump to it, I'll just I'll say it. I think it's come up on the screen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. So my second takeaway is going to be strip off your mask when sharing the gospel. Lean on others for support. The enemy loves, he loves us to be isolated. He wants nothing more than us to try to go at life on our own. That's just not biblical. Now, I've been, my, my church has been out in Hendersonville where there's a large community. It's more suburbanite, neck, neck of the woods. Now I'm moving out here to Robertson County, and it's a little bit more rural. It's very easy for us to just kind of sit home on our property and just ignore the world around us and just kind of sit back with our blinders and just, you know, expect everything to just magically work out. But at that point, you're isolating. He wants us to get out into our communities. And we're going to talk a little bit about Celebrate Recovery and places like the Hope Center here a little bit while on what we can do to, be, to better our community. How can we get best to get out there and make a difference in the world around us? Look, I'm not, you know, I was a D-minus student. I barely graduated high school. I may not be the smartest tool in the shed, but to me, common sense says the only way we're going to change the world is by being out in it. All right? We cannot, we cannot make change by sitting on our couches. You know, we can't make change by just coming to church on Sundays. Church has got to be seven days of the week, 365. It's about sharing the gospel every opportunity you get. So go ahead with me to Mark, chapter, Mark 6, 7 through 9. Then Jesus, then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority of, over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. We got to strip ourselves down. The only way that for the folks that are on the fence, I just did a study not too long, or study for a sermon I got coming up here really soon. On the fall of the church, in the past 10 years, we have lost about 75 million Christians. And we're not losing the 75 million to the atheists. We're losing to the non-believers. We're losing the kids. We're losing the, 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 the millennials. The millennials have a thousand options to choose from now to find where is their, where is their higher power. Because we're, because we're not getting out there. We're not being intentional. As a church body, as a body of Christ, we need to make sure we're being intentional in all that we do. And part of that is, is staying in community, reaching out to others, letting others know there's hope. Every day, there are men and women getting discharged from Robertson County Jail. How often do you think they're turning around and falling right back into their sin? Because when they get out, they don't think there's any chance of hope, that there is no, uh, you know, this is all I know. Well, as a church body, we need to make sure that we're able to be there for them, extending that hand, letting them know that, hey, come to us. We'll, we'll, we'll love on you. We'll, we'll, keep you. we'll keep you in stride. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. This is one of my favorite verses. In every men's group that I lead, um, I, I start my prayer off of this every single time. Today, I, I pray right now that as we all leave here today, that we all walk out sharper than the way we came in. Amen to that? Because if you walk out just as dull, then we're not doing our job as a church. We've got to be able to lean on each other, lift each other up in our, in our successes and our failures. Part of the reason why I do love my accountability groups, not just to go and share what's on my heart as far as what I'm struggling with, but man, I love sharing the gift of hope. There's nothing better 
you know, some people say it's pride. It's not pride. There's no pride in sharing what Jesus has done in your life. None whatsoever. But why as society are we not sharing it? That's why you're seeing these numbers drop off in just the past 10 years. Because the minority, the non-believers and the atheists are telling us their voices are louder. As Christians, why are our voices not being heard? You know, and it has nothing to do with politics. This has everything to do with the truth of the word. Why are we not getting out there and screaming from the mountain on high about what God has done in our lives? You don't necessarily have to like beat them with the Bible over their head. You can at least share freely what God has done in your life. Ten years ago, I was an agnostic atheist. I wasn't a believer until I met my wife. And she said the only way she'd marry me if I became a Christian. So I figured, hey, how hard, how hard could that be? Boy, did I figure out how hard that could be. You know, and it took a little while. You know, some of us are a little thick-headed than others. It took me a period. My third takeaway. Our, our decisions today need to glorify God, not the world. To, to kind of set up this, port, this section of Mark, uh, this is when John the Baptist was beheaded by the king. Now, the only reason he was really in prison because John the Baptist told King Herod that, you know, his wife of choice, who was his brother's wife, this was not script, you know, it was biblically wrong. And then you can go back to Old Testament, and it clearly states on who you're allowed to wed and who you're not allowed to, who you're not allowed to wed. Obviously, this does not sit well with King Herod and his wife. And his wife is very bitter. They're having a celebration. And as the celebration is going on for, the, for his wife's daughter, he said, King Herod says, hey, what is it that you like? You tell me anything that you want, and I'll give it whatever it is. And she tells him, okay, I want, I want John the Baptist's head. So King Herod was kind of torn on this. He really didn't want to do it. So you go to Mark 26, 26 to 28. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent the executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, the man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl and gave it to her mother. Key word I want to focus on there that John that the king was deeply distressed. He knew there was he knew he was making a bad decision. He knew it was not God's will that he go behead John. He knew it was a bad choice. How many times in our lives do we make bad decisions based off in the world around us? Uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, I'm going to get a little nerdy here, okay, so bear with me. He was the father of the atomic bomb. He was the man that the um, U.S. military pulled out from Germany towards the end of, towards the end of the war, and he was basically the creator of the atomic bomb. He was a scientist. A lot of folks in science and, and uh, you know, guys like Einstein, guys like this, they, they, they want to further educate. They want to push the envelope. But there's always going to be repercussions for some decisions we make. And Oppenheimer really struggled with this years later after the atomic bomb was dropped because he saw what it did. You know, yes, it ended the war. You know, it, saved, it probably saved millions of lives if, we had not, if Truman had not dropped the bomb. But what, did it, what, were the, what, were the by, what was the byproduct of that for those Generation Xers? The Cold War. You know, I grew up in the 80s where it was, you know, rent, um, never mind. My wife's, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of that movie. Sorry, squirrel. Uh, but 80s, it was all movies about, you know, fighting rush, the USSR, the struggle that was going on there. You know, it was, it was all about what country can make the more missiles, we, were, we lived on the verge of a nuclear meltdown at any given point, and we still do today. Every time the new, you hear it in the news, but this is what Oppenheimer was worried about. He was worried about a choice he made now coming back to bite him. In reality, it did. This really bit him because he, he did not want Jesus to be pronounced king. So by his choice of killing John, if you actually read the other Gospels, you'll see that Jesus got a whole new fire lit underneath him. That, I mean, that fired him up even more. So, I mean, he, he already had enough behind him, but he fired him even more to go out there and share the word and make sure that his message was heard. And I think by Herod beheading John was kind of that catalyst, kind of like Oppenheimer creating the A-bomb. 
Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be, tra- be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you are able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Whatever decisions we make today will affect tomorrow. If we decide to turn blind eyes to those struggling in our communities, you know, we're going to have to reap the benefits. Right now, you can turn on the news, you can see opioid epidemics at an all-time high in this country for choices that we made. The pharmaceutical companies dumping millions and millions of money in, you know, in, in, into, the, into the lawmakers to allow these bills to pass through. But what's it doing to our society right now? You know, show of hands, does anybody know anybody that struggles with an opioid addiction? Does anybody know anybody that's passed away from an opioid addiction? I'm seeing a lot of hands. And that's a sad thing. But what are we doing about it? It's our responsibility to stand and do what it's right. His perfect will. All right, continuing on down. My fourth takeaway is never doubt what can be done in the name of Jesus Christ. This is where you start to see uh, the, the, between the four Gospels, the, the proof. Um, if, if there's an accident or maybe a, a bank robbery and the cops show up to, in, to uh, talk to folk, witnesses, generally they'll say, if all witnesses say the same exact thing, there's some falsehood going there. But if all four witnesses share a similar story with variances, that there's probably a lot of truth. And this is where I kind of love the gospel. Again, this is a second telling. Mark and Peter have sat down over a period of time as Peter shared the gospel with Mark as he started writing this down. And this Mark, everything that Mark is saying is backed up in the other gospels. Maybe worded a little differently, and we'll talk about that in the next takeaway. So right now we're going to talk about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Which for a lot of us, that's an amazing miracle. I don't know about you guys, but I just, it's one of those miracles I would have to witness for me to ever fully understand how he did it. Because I don't know about you, that seems just really crazy. How is he able to feed that many people with just a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish? Now, Philip, who was one of his disciples, who was very kind of pessimistic, he was very analytical. Anybody analytical thinkers? where you've got to kind of see things to believe it. You know, it's got to make sense. And Jesus kind of tested Philip on this when he said, hey, this is what we're going to do. And Philip's first reaction was, I just don't see how, how this is going to happen. You know, it's going to take, you know, basically all, everything that we earn for a year just to build supply of food to all these folks. Mark six thirty seven. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half year's wages. Are we going to spend that much on bread and give them to eat? Give it to them to eat? So this is where John 6, 5 through 7, if you want to jump there for me. John chapter 6, verse 5 and 7. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now I'll pause right there. At this point, Jesus never did anything on the fly. Everybody agree with that? He always had a purpose for everything he said. So to me, this is a test. Where is your loyalty? Where's your faith? He's, he's asking Philip. He already gave him a command. Hey, whatever we have, feed them. And Philip replies back to him, it would take more than half a year's wages by buying enough bread for each to have a bite. Basically, he tested them. Ben Franklin, who's one of my favorite folks in history, in American, especially in American history, had a very simple phrase. When in doubt, don't. Basically, what I hear Ben Franklin saying, don't doubt. Why, why question? Just say, yes, sir, and move on. I don't know about y'all, but anytime God's put something on my heart, as a military person, what I like to say is I just kind of said, yes, sir. I just hand salute and say, yes, sir. Whenever I give him that hand salute and say, what can I do, Father? Man, my life is amazing. Anybody say amen to that one? But when we fight it and try to take control of our own lives and question and doubt God's purpose for something, usually it winds up failing. 
Why? Because it wasn't God's will. All right, number five. Have faith that Jesus will see us through the storm. One of my favorite songs, uh, Casting Crowns, I'm a big fan of Casting Crowns. Um, one of my favorite songs is Voice of Truth. There are many times in my life that I've, there's a line in there we talked about David and Goliath. You know, how wish he had the strength to stand. But meanwhile, he's standing there next to the th- sound of a thousand warriors shaking their armor. There are many times in my life that just even coming today talking to y'all, I feel like one of those warriors shaking my armors at time, at armor at time. I got to tell myself, I am a David. I can reach down. I can grab that stone. I'm going to take my giant down. What qualifies me to stand up here and talk in front of y'all? Nothing. The only thing is change live. I just said, yes, sir. That's it. And this, anybody could do this. It's not rocket science. It's really not. It's just surrendering, surrendering and being obedient to the Lord. The other, the other part of that song is when he talks about Peter stepping out, stepping out in the water. And the moment he took his eyes off when he starts to sink. And I tell you, that song gets me every time. That is my go-to jam every time. I feel like, you know, I'm listening to the enemy tell me the lies and get inside my brain. Mark 6, 47 through 52. Later that night, let me set this up. So after Jesus feeds the 5,000, he tells his disciples, all right, guys, go to the other side of the lake. Start heading there. I'm going to go up. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get some alone time, get some my alone, my alone prayer time. I'll catch up to y'all. Now, they got like the only boat. So how's he, you know, that, you think at some point they probably would have questioned that part too, but never, it doesn't ever cause it out. So they get in the boat and they start rowing across. Jesus goes, he prays. And as the sunlight's starting to rise, he's going to go off and meet him. How's he going to do it? He's going to walk on water. So later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. How often do we try to go through life in a storm and try to do it on our own? How often do we sit there and say, nobody will understand what I'm going through? What I find kind of comical about this scripture compared to what you look at, if you look into Matthew, is Matthew is putting it in the first person. He was there. He witnessed it. This is, in Mark, it's a retelling from Peter's point of view. So I don't know about y'all, but usually if there was a big event in my life and maybe I did something stupid, I may admit my stupid part. Anybody? My wife's giggling. She's like, yeah. Yeah, I'll talk about all the great things, but I'm not going to talk about the stuff that I, you know, messed up. Uh, Matthew 14, 28 through 31. Now, this is Matthew's recollection of this event happening. Lord, it is you. Lord, it is you, Peter replied. Tell me to come out of the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? So this is the part where I find comical where you get, this, this almost backs up what folks are saying. Because Peter kind of admitted that part to Mark. I think that would have been a good point to make in the, in the book of Mark as well to kind of solidify it. I think Peter really didn't quite push that part to him. In our storm of our lives, we're going to have highs and lows. It's just inevitable. If life would be perfect, everybody would do it. We're going to have successes. We're going to have failures. 
It's what do we do with what do we do with those successes? What do we do with those failures? Do we take our successes and give us all the glory, or do we give God? In our failures, do we continue to blame others, or maybe even blame God? There may be folks in here that maybe this is your first time in a church. Maybe you haven't been in a church for a while, and maybe part of that reason is because you do blame God. But God has never done anything to harm you. It's always our choices and our decisions that we've made that brought us down those paths, all right? God has always laid out, he lays out a very thin road for us to go down. But unfortunately, we all like to have, go down the five-lane highway, which is a heck of a lot easier, it may seem at the time, but until all of a sudden now you're stuck on 65 in the middle of rush hour, you're really wishing you took the back country road. Now, working in Nashville for years, man, there were many times I'd just take a back country road to get home, and I got home just in the same amount of time as if I take the interstate, and I was a heck of a lot more peaceful. I was able to get quiet time, get some worship music going, a much calmer pace as, as far as speed. It was nice, always nice, smooth sailing. So when we get on that high, the, the 65 of life, you know, and get caught up with all the noise around us that we have a tendency of getting bogged down. There's not a single storm that Jesus can't see us through. Um, one of the big issues that we're trying to get going here in Robertson County is Celebrate Recovery. Has anybody heard of Celebrate Recovery? I see a couple of hands. Now, beautiful thing about Celebrate Recovery, if you do not know about it, Celebrate Recovery is a faith-based ministry, not just for recovery for drugs and alcohol, but for life. Everybody needs counsel. Everybody needs support and folks around them. Two-thirds of the people in Celebrate Recovery do not have addictions. My wife doesn't have an addiction. She just married a moron. No, no that's, that's, that's what she's in recovery for. Yeah, amen, baby? Okay, see, there we go. No, that, that's, that's her struggle. I was the one that had struggled with a chemical addiction, with, with alcohol, not hers. Uh, what about Work. There's so many struggles out there. Are, we, are you working 70 hours a week because you're chasing a dollar? Because you're trying to, you know, get ahead in life instead of chasing Jesus. Celebrate Recovery is for more than just addictions. It's a great place where folks can kind of come together and realize that your story is not alone. Ministries like Celebrate Recovery, we don't focus on what got you or why you're here. Because we all have a story. We all have a struggle. We all have something that we're going through right now. We like to focus on what got you here. What were the things that led to where you're at? If you're struggling with your faith, why are you struggling with your faith? You know, maybe you were hurt by the church or maybe you were hurt by a family member or somebody that caused, caused that separation between you and God. Celebrate Recovery kind of helps weed that out and get you on the path. Because what is God? Is God the church or is he the body? He's the body, right? We make up the church, not these four walls. I mean, it's a beautiful church. First thing I said, I walked in. I said, this is a lovely worship center. But this is not the church. All you men and women out here are the church. And Celebrate Recovery, we let people know they're not alone. Because very often, again, I go back to the, to the enemy. His favorite tool is to say, nobody will understand what you're going through. That's one of the greatest lies the enemy loves to tell us. And that is no bigger lie. One of my, other, uh, my military time, I was in the Navy. One of my first ships was an aircraft carrier. Now, has anybody ever seen an aircraft carrier in person? You see them on TV? They're massive ships. The, the, the rope to tie down a carry to its pier is around about that thick. Think about how many strands of fiber in that rope to tie that boat down to a pier. That's, that's how big my rope is right now, and I'm super blessed because well, you, the more strands you add in your life, that rope will never be broken, and that's through community. I have so many men and women that will love on me and lift me up, keep me tied to my peers so I don't get blown out to sea. And when, I, when that tension starts to get a little bit of tight, every member on that rope is more than willing to step out and call me out and ask me, how am I doing? What's going on? Is everything Okay. Or I'll tell you right now, they'll be the first to, to praise you and lift you up in your successes. And I am super blessed to have the forever family that God's put in my life right now. And things like Celebrate Recovery is, is 
part of that reason where I'm, where I'm at right now. I give all glory to God and all the men and women he's put in my life. Uh, I say that because we've got the Hope Center here, um, and part of their process is using, utilizing Celebrate Recovery. Right now, Hendersonville area, they're booming. Clarksville's starting to get a little bit of a growth. But if you look on the map between 65 and 24, there's not a lot of faith-based initiatives for recovery programs in the area. Now, talk with Patrick and a couple other churches here in Robertson County. We feel it's prime for the picking. Why not? Let's get, off, let's get off our couches and get out in the communities. Let's go out and change some lives. Let's, let's bring some folks back into the church. Now, Celebrate Recovery may not necessarily grow your numbers, but Celebrate Recovery will make a difference in our communities. You know, I get tired of seeing fatality after fatality of overdoses or broken marriages because a couple struggle, or maybe the male struggling pornography, and they sit there and watch that decimate. Or I hate to see a couple get divorced because they're working or they're just not knowing how to communicate because they're trying to isolate themselves and they don't, the guy or the, the, the wife or the husband doesn't have an accountability group that they can talk to of like-minded folks. So I pray as a church, as Patrick and I start to step out on this walk as bringing Celebrate Recovery to the area, um, you know, I pray you guys think on it, pray on it, and if there's something you're interested in as far as helping out, attending, by all means, you can reach out to my, myself or Patrick. Um, it's going to be a really great thing. It's going to be a game changer in our community. All right, so at this time, I'll, go, I'll uh, close out in prayer. Maybe there's something you're struggling with in your life. You know, maybe there's some of these action points that you, know, that you need to help Jesus see you through the faith. Your, your waters are choppy. Are you like Peter? taking your eyes off of him and starting to fall down in the water? Are you, do you have that little faith? Are you putting your faith in other things? Are you putting your faith in your job? Where does your, where does your identity lie? Right now, my identity lies in Jesus Christ. When I, not, when I say my name, I say, hello, my name is Matt. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I used to struggle with alcohol. That used to be my identity. Today is purely in Jesus. So bow your heads with me if you would.